G'day, my name is Kate, part of the Narrate team. This morning, Adam asks, how do you receive criticism? On the flip side, how effective are you in sharing your critical observations with others? How can we be people who challenge each other to get better in a safe and productive way? Hi. So I was thinking to myself, it was actually during the last service before I jumped up here of so you noticed Bill, uh, the, 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 the guy with the great beard, which I learned he's been growing since September. Uh, so that was his first time playing bass. And, and his story very much embodies uh, everything that I'd like to kind of provoke you to think about this morning. In September, Bill auditioned to play with uh, the band. And Kate had the unenviable responsibility to look at him and go, uh, not yet. And to kind of point out some areas where he needed to grow as a musician and so at that point, he has a choice to make, right? Like he goes and finds another church where they'll let him play bass um, and get mad and all those things. Or, or he takes some criticism and some feedback. And uh, to, to Bill's credit, I just, this is like the, the best part of the whole worship experience for me this morning, literally, of what Bill did is he went and hired, he went and spent his own money, got lessons, started growing as a bassist, stayed connected with Kate. And over the last couple months, he's been going to rehearsals several times a month and kind of playing with them, but still not getting it to the stage. And then finally this morning, he's, he's here which I just think is such a cool testament to the band and to Bill and to Kate and all those things coming together. So really this morning, uh, the, the win for me uh, in terms of the way I think about what's the goal here this morning is if you leave this morning provoked to think about how you receive criticism and, and your posture towards it, uh, you could use the word teachable. Like, like how, do, you, do you lean into it or do you run away from it? And then also the other part of that is it's kind of two sides of the same coin. I'd like to provoke you to think a little bit about how, how effective are you at offering it? Because listen, I know you're opinionated. We're all opinionated. I know you're judgmental. We're all judgmental. But, but I, what I want to know is how, how effective are you at actually sharing those observations with the people? Like have you developed the ability to go like, yeah, no, not, not yet. Uh, have you ever, think of it this way, uh, have you ever got home from a day at the office or maybe got home on a Saturday afternoon and realized that, you know, you were spending and you just spent the day with some friends and you walk by that mirror in your bedroom and you realize your flies down. Ever had that happen? Of course, of course you have. Like, and, and then you, you kind of go into that cold sweat and you start thinking back like, oh gosh, I was in this meeting and this meeting. I met with her and him and them and oh, did you just And then you, you, you literally like, well, I don't think I went to the bathroom since like nine o'clock this morning. <laughs> Ever had that? Or, or you, you have dinner with somebody or maybe you had a date with somebody or a meeting and you get in your car and as you're uh, looking in the rearview mirror, as you're reversing out of your parking spot, you look and there's a bug hanging out of your nose. <laughs> ever, ever had that? Isn't your sense like, I thought someone loved me. Like, I know it's awkward for you to point it out, but could I point out that it's more awkward for me to go six hours with my, like, how many of you have checked your fly since I started doing this? <laughs> just, just tell me, right? Like, I can deal with it. Just tell me. That's what I want to wrestle with this morning. Is this, uh, is that true? Like, do, do you want to hear the feedback? And, and, and are you able to offer it? Not in those, like, us men, we're really great at the firestorm, right? Like, it's been building up, building up. One of, I have a friend who calls it gunny sacking. The gunny sack is full. Here we go. Like, we're just going through all of it in the next 30 seconds. It'll all be new information. Like, not that. I mean, can you make an observation about an employee, a friend, a spouse, a child? And can you think for days, maybe weeks, and be really calculated? And will you actually sit down and talk to them? That's kind of what I'd like to wrestle with this morning. We've been in this series called Speak. Um, I, I love that video. There's part of me that would like to see a flamethrower. I feel like that'd be a little more accurate, but we, we cut that one from the budget. Uh, but what we started by talking about was the idea that like, our words matter, that they're not, not, they're not inconsequential, that, that they actually they, they take on a life of their own. And, and we all know this. None of this. Nothing in this series is new information. It's just kind of revisiting stuff and thinking about the way we use words. And then two weeks ago, what we wrestled with was that there's this statement that I think most of us were raised with that uh, if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything at all. Remember that one? Uh, often quoted, never followed. It's one of those statements. And what we talked about a couple weeks ago was like there, there, there's some brilliance to that statement. That, that if we can learn to be more positive in our words and all those different things, I mean, yeah, that, that, that's a huge win. But what I'd like to point out this morning and really wrestle with this morning is, I guess the devil's advocate part of me, did you know, you know where that statement came from? I learned this recently, that it used to be when someone was going to be declared a saint, they would hire someone to build the case against them, hence the devil's advocate. 
trivial information you didn't need to know. Uh, but, but that part of my brain, when, when I think about this speak thing, what I think is we could lean too far in one direction, and what we could fail is the need that we all have to have people in our lives who are willing to be honest with us and go, dude, there's a booger in your nose. Awkward for me to tell you, more awkward for you to have it, let's just go there. There's a booger in your nose. Like, we, we've got to develop that skill set. Uh, did you watch the Olympics? Bob Costas, I Goobers, like, really, NBC, can we not give that poor man America back? And did anybody else see that? It's terrible. One of the things that stood out to me as I was watching was that, that when I think of a coach, I think of team sports, baseball, football, basketball, hockey, those types of things. Did you notice that it, whether they were like doing flips in the air on skis or d- doing the giant slalom or whether they were ice dancers, we could debate whether or not that's a sport, but let's not take that tangent. Uh, like no, no, matter, no matter what the sport, did you notice how many of the athletes had coaches? And that the announcers always go like, ah, oh, their coach is over there, and they'd zoom the camera over to some person with a little pom-pom on their head. And it's interesting to me and that, I mean, I'm assuming that if you spend four years trying to win a gold medal in bobsled, money can be kind of hard to come by. And yet it raises the question, like, well, why, why do these people spend their own hard-earned money? Like, I'm not talking the Olympic coaches. I'm talking their own personal coaches. Why do they spend their own hard-earned money hiring a coach? Why would they do that? And see, it, it quickly starts to point out some, some things, and, and, and just, this, this kind of, for me, captures where we're going this morning, that there's some assumptions that we can make about the person who spends their own money hiring a coach. And the first one is that they understand they have some glaring weaknesses. Like, that athlete understands that what stands between me and success are some weaknesses that, that I may or may not know I have, that I may or may not be able to see, but nonetheless, first and foremost, they can acknowledge I have weaknesses, The other assumption, the second thing that comes to mind for me is that that what we can assume about that person is that not only they have weaknesses, but they want to work on them. Because it's really easy to go like, I'm going to be one of those guys that's so amazing that I break all the rules and I still win. And that happens about every 20 years, but mostly you have to follow the rules. They they, they want to know what they are. The, The other assumption is, it seems to me safe to assume that what they understand is they're blind to most of their weaknesses. I mean, they go through a whole day with their fly down. They, they realize that, that they're prone to that. Uh, Sarah pointed out to me a little while ago, a few weeks ago, that I chew my fingernails in meetings. And I went, that's disgusting. Thank you for telling me that. Like, I'm 35 years old. All these other people hate me. Like, why didn't they tell me that? Uh, that these guys, they, they understand they have them. They, they want to work on them. Blind in the sense that, have you ever had something that you're convinced was a strength? And it took a long time for someone to wrestle you to the ground and say, no, 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 that's, that's a weakness. Like you think when you stick your arm out on the side of the backflip, it looks cool. It looks stupid. Or, or, or they're blind in the sense of they're in the moment, that they can't see them. Here, here's another way to think of it if you're a professional sports fan. Like we want to we think the people who win on Sundays are the most talented athletes, don't we? Are they? Or are they the ones that watch the most film and get the most halftime phone calls? But that's a tangent. Anyway... Fourth assumption, therefore, that I think we can make is this, that in order uh, to capitalize on my abilities and my calling, I'll need outside help. Like if I'm really, see, here, here, here's my point, is, is those guys are trying to win a gold medal in bobsledding. Like, you, you're trying to love your spouse. You're trying to raise kids that actually contribute to the world in a healthy way. Uh, you, you're trying to lead that company. You're trying to make money. You're trying to grow in your position. You're trying to be a good friend. You're trying to be a good Christ follower. And all that raises the question for me, if they need help, do, do, do we? If they need coaches and people in their lives, whether they have the formal title or not, who are willing to tell them not just the good stuff, because I'm assuming that they don't hire a coach just because they need someone to stroke their ego and tell them in the morning, like, hey, you're great, and here's your toast. Like, I'm guessing it's more than that, aren't you? Like, if, if, if they need that to win a gold medal, might, might you need it to be the spouse that you wanted to be when you stood on the altar? Uh, might, might, might you need it to be the parent that you swore you'd be when it first came out of the chute? <laughs> it's one of my goals is to work that phrase into every sermon for the next foreseeable future. Like, like might, might you need some, some coaching? Like, could, could, could that be part of the deal? You know, uh, Dr. Cloud... He has a statement, he's just, sorry, I just lost my train of thought there, which I shouldn't tell you because then it makes it worse. But Dr. Cloud has this statement, uh, he, he says this, he says, great leaders are hungry for reality. Here's the question that I want to ask, is, is, that, is that you? 
But what he says is great, like mediocre leaders, they, they don't want reality. They, they want to feel good. Great leaders, uh, the other way he says it is they move toward problems. They don't see problems as problems. They see problems as opportunities to become better at whatever it is they set out to become better at. Is, is, that, is that your posture? Is, is that the way you roll? And it strikes me that for those of us that try to think through life, through the, through, through the grid of scripture, through the worldview that the, that the scriptures offer, it's so funny to me that you could argue, I think in pretty strong fashion, that the, the, un, the uh, not being open to criticism is literally at the core of the human sin condition. Like the inability to hear negative stuff, the inability to turn to someone and go, what do you think? The inability to, to recognize that you have problems and that you need help with your problems, it's literally in the very beginning. Like go back to the garden. You've got Adam and Eve and harmony and everything's good between them, between them and God, between them and creation. And, and Eve, she has this remarkable conversation with evil. And evil says, did God really say to you, you must not eat any of the fruit from the trees in the Garden of Eden? Which incidentally is not anywhere close to what he said. What he said is, there's 10,000 trees. See this one over here? Don't eat from it. That's 9,999 uh, 9, that you can. Funny how the temptation doesn't change though, right? Did God really say you can never eat any fruit? No. But what did Eve do in that moment? Or what did she not do? I tell you what I think she didn't do was well, she didn't recognize that her pulse was increasing that her palms were getting sweaty, that she was dreaming and visioneering and she was having ideas and she was, going, she was beginning to imagine a different future, a, a different opportunity. She was beginning to think about 10 years and 20 years and 30 years from now. And what she didn't do is recognize that in those moments, her neurology is getting messed up and her thinking is not reliable. And she didn't turn to Adam and go, hey, I got some ideas. What do you think? I think Eve's unwillingness to subject her thoughts and opinions and dreams and ambitions and desires to someone else, to a coach, if you will, is what got her in all the trouble. And yet that's only half of the story because the other half of the story, and I guess the reason why I feel like we need to tackle it all at the same time, the other half of the story is Adam was doing some things or not doing some things. This person who, who Eve was trusting to, to love her, what, what did he do in that moment? What did he say in that moment? Crickets. Nothing. And I wonder, I wonder if the, uh, our own capacity to offer feedback or not offer feedback, if it's costing people in our lives who we love and it's costing them dearly. I wonder who the people are in your life that if I sat down and had a conversation and went, hey, listen, do you have a coach? And I don't mean formally, but like, is there somebody uh, that, that you could trust that would challenge you if you needed a challenge? They would tell you you were being crazy if you were being crazy. They were telling you you were dating crazy if you were dating crazy. Oh, yeah. And they would name you. And I wonder, would you? Or do you value the, the friendship more? You know, we live in this culture. We don't talk to people. We talk about them. First, like, don't feel a bony finger. Like, it's pointing back at me first. But, but, right, we watch somebody and they're thinking about this job or they're thinking about, uh, you know, spending money on this or thinking about moving here. They're thinking about marrying her. Or they're thinking about marrying him or whatever. And, and we, we watch them and we go, oh, this is crazy. And what do we do? We go home and we tell our wife, hey, you should hear what, you should hear what they're doing. And, we, and, and you know what Christians do? Uh, we, we have this big spiritual phrase for when we do that. You know what it's called? Hey, you should pray for. Oh, yeah, why should I pray for them? Da, 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 da. Oh, yeah, I should pray for them. You're not praying for them. That's called gossip. It's a spiritual ease over, over an issue that says, I don't like to talk about the hard stuff with anyone. So what are you going to do? Oh, I'm going to pray to God, and I'm going to ask God to send somebody into their life. Well, that sounds like really good circular logic. You know, there's a guy named Robert Kaplan. Uh, he, he wrote this. He's got some really good leadership books. He's a kind of this well-respected corporate coach. He wrote this, this terrible named book, uh, What to Ask the Person in the Mirror. Don't you think of Michael Jackson when you see that? Come on, you can't name your book that. that taken. Find a new metaphor. Uh, anyway, uh, he, he notes, because part of this is your ability to receive it. Part of it is your ability to offer it. He, he spent hours and hours and hours and hours, thousands of hours with some of the best, biggest uh, companies in the world. And he says that after working with companies, what he's found is that the number one reason why an employee leaves, now let me just kind of parenthetically, he, he acknowledges there's things we can't do, uh, you know, 
spouses get different jobs, kids are born, people move. There's things we can't do to prevent people from leaving the organization. But when we could have, he said, you know what the number one, like by far reason people leave a company and organization is, you know what it is? A lack of coaching. He says, we have this perception that people get dissatisfied at work when they're coached too much, they're corrected too much, they're criticized too much. And can we just allow like, yeah, that can happen. But the number one reason, he says, uh, that that people leave their job, they leave the organization, is because they were recruited like you were recruited. What they were told was, you come here and we'll develop your skills and we'll give you training and you'll become better and we'll become better and it'll be this win-win and everyone's going to grow and we're going to invest in your education and all these things. But their real experience was what? Here's the keys. I'm busy. Now you're busy. Holler if you're drowning. He says the biggest reason people leave an organization is, is, is a lack of feedback. I wonder, like, those friends that you're afraid to offend, might they be craving it? Might, might they actually want it? Might, might they be really frustrated if they knew that you knew there was a booger hanging out of their nose and you won't tell them? The, the Proverbs address this. Uh, in, in Proverbs, I think it's 27. In Proverbs 27, 6, it says this, uh, Wounds from a friend can be trusted, but an enemy multiplies kisses. Now, isn't that counterintuitive? Because we, we like to think that the people who love us are the ones who pat us on the back and they never say anything bad. And what the Proverbs understand, which is this 30,000 foot level view of wisdom and what really works and what's really functional in life, what they say is, no, 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 no. Those people who just tell you all the time that you're great and there's nothing wrong with you, be very careful. Because all that means is they say it to your friends, not to you. In Proverbs twenty thirty. Uh, it says something similar. Blows and wounds scrub away evil, and beatings purge the inmost being. I mean, how many of you have that in your like resume for, hey, I'm a good friend. I'm good at beating you up. And yet that's what it's saying. D- did you know, uh, Pontiac, anybody own a Pontiac? I just need to clarify this before I go on this. Yeah, good job. Because um, did, 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 when I was in high school, the who's who of high school was who drove a Pontiac two-door Grand Am, right? Because people didn't know that the doors fall off when they're three years old. The high school students don't care. But, but did you know Pontiac doesn't exist anymore? Like, you can't buy a Pontiac anymore? Sherry knows that because she, she can't get a new tire or something. But, but uh, did, did you know, though, that, that Pontiac... Okay, you know why they don't exist? Because a bankruptcy judge said, you're not going to exist anymore. But here's what's fascinating. Pontiac didn't turn a profit for 20 plus years. So you're a business owner, you work in an office, you you fit this through in your head. For 20 plus years, Pontiac lost money for GM and no one did anything. It took a bankruptcy judge to sit across from these incredibly well-educated, they could have had any CEO position in any company in the world. It took a bankruptcy judge to look at them and go, hey, listen, it's broken. Shut it down. What is that? I think it's indicative of a culture that leans away from being honest. And if we're going to talk about words, I think one of the most challenging things we could talk about, I know it's one of the most challenging things in my own leadership, is the need that we have for people who are willing to go there. Listen to the way Psalm says it. In Psalm 140, or is it 141? Yeah, 141. Sorry, someday I'm going to learn to thumbnail these, but in the meantime. uh, Let a righteous man strike me. This is David. Let a righteous man strike me. That is a kindness. Let him rebuke me. That is oil on my head. That's crazy talk. And yet, what is he saying? Man, I have these dreams to be a leader, to be a, to be a husband, to be a father. I have these dreams uh, to be the type of friend. And I so need the people who are willing to tell me, hey, your fly's down. And everyone's laughing at you. You really need to address that. And wear underwear next time. Just kidding. Sorry. So, so uh, the question becomes, how do we do this? Just kind of naming the awkwardness, because I know your, your brains were there, so I just step into the awkwardness. Uh, so so uh, the question becomes, how, how, do, how do we do this, right? Like, how, how do we actually begin to be the kinds of people who, who, who live this stuff out? And I don't, 
I, I realize there's a million different things we could talk about. We really need to talk about the role of relationship because, you know, if you don't know me, I probably don't want you telling me, like, all this really hard stuff. But, uh, and likewise, we, we probably need to talk about the fact that the good needs to outweigh the bad, and we probably need to talk about, like, no gunny sacking. Like, there's all those things. But as I've been wrestling with this, because th- th- this is no euphemism, no exaggeration, I've recognized, when I read that book from, by Robert Kaplan, I, I was very challenged because I recognized that, that that was one thing as a leader that I was very terrible at, was sitting down with people and going, listen, whether volunteers or staff or whatever, going, listen, you've got to work on this. This is not good. And, and really helping people that way. So how do we do it? And I, I've kind of boiled it down to two things for myself. That, that, and what this helps me to do is it helps me understand when I'm on the right track. It also helps me identify who I want in my life doing this for me. And the first thing is simply this, mean what you say. Now that sounds so trite and so simple, but most of us, uh, w- w- you know the game. In fact, the, the best marriage advice I was ever given uh, was, and I've referenced this 10,000 times because of it, was my friend Fred, uh, him saying to my wife and I, listen, if the only thing you do is establish this rule, you'll be worlds ahead of everybody else. Okay, what's the rule? He said, you just agree that you'll only say what you mean and you only mean what you say. What do you mean by that? It means, Adam, that, that if you say to Teresa, hey, do you mind if I go to Portland for the weekend? And she says yes, she really means yes. Sounds simple. Is it? No, because what, what's the, the normal culture of most relationships? And I was, grew up in this. I'm good at it. You're good at it. We all grew up in it. Is, is what really happens is she means no. I'm picking on her. I'm the one that's actually good at this. I, I said no, but I mean yes. And if you love me enough, you'll figure out that my no actually means yes. And you'll kind of figure the riddle out. And so when you get home, I said no, I know, but I said yes. So how dare you go? Because I said no or yes. Ah! You with me? I, I think for me, the number one gauge in, in terms of how I'm doing and, and, and who I want doing this for me is, uh, is it all being said or is it being left unsaid? You ever hang out with somebody and, and they, they, they talk about a third party, da, 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 all these things that are wrong with them, and then you hang out the three of you and none of it's said? It's like suddenly they're the president of the United States and they're the greatest person in the world. You ever have that? Uh, you do. I, I do it. So let's just be clear. Warning. They have it. They're just not saying it to you. I was talking to a friend this week going, hey, man, someone, someone's got to go there with them. Not me. I don't want to do that. That's the hard part. Uh, for me, the number one gauge is I, I want to find people who, who mean what they say. And Jesus, like, wouldn't you expect that God would have addressed this? Listen to the way he says it from the message. He says, and don't say, go ahead, Jimmy, and don't say anything you don't mean. I mean, we just quit there. This council is embedded deep in our traditions. You only make things worse when you lay down a smoke screen of pious talk saying, I'll pray for you, and go ahead, and never doing it, or saying, God be with you, and not meaning it. You don't make your words true by embellishing them with religious lace. In making your speech sound more religious, it becomes less true. Just say yes and no. When you manipulate words to get your own way, you go wrong. Just say what you mean and mean what you say. I was, Bill Hybels told this story years ago about a gal that he bumped into. Bill Hybels leads this church in the Chicago, South Barrington area. And it's this mass, one of the biggest churches in the country. So they have this massive campus, like take Helena, put it inside of it kind of campus. And he was walking through this campus at one point and, and this gal stopped him. And, and he, they'd had, you know, brief interactions before. And he said, in hindsight, uh, he thought she was training to be a mime because she was doing like this kinds of stuff as she was talking. But then he eventually recognized that she had a new ring on her left finger and she really wanted him to like notice what was on her left hand. And uh, so we find, oh, so you're getting married. Yeah, so tell me about him. And she's just, ah, just gushing about this guy. And then she said, well, the reason I stopped you is I, I, I want to know like, where do I go for some premarital work? He said, oh, great. And so he, he pulls out a piece of paper or something, and he writes down the number that he needs to call the church to get connected with the premarital work. And, and she kept talking, and she said something in him caused him to think that like, there was more to what she was asking. And he finally said, listen, is there something specific that you'd like to talk about? And he said, completely casual. She said, well, yeah, I mean, he's great. And she kind of started revisiting all the reasons why he was great. And he's like, yeah, yeah, I get that he's great. Talk to me. She said, well, he, he lies a lot. And he said, you mean like he thinks he's joking, you think he's lying, like ha, 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 different sense of humor? No, she said. He said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, like, like she'll say that he's working, but he's with his friends. And, and he's, you know, he's just turning ashen at this point. 
well, give me another example. Well, like one time he, he got some money for a side job he did, and it was actually this much, but he told me it was this much. And he said, give me that card back. So he gives him the card back, and he crumples it up, sticks it in his pocket, grabs a new piece of paper, hands her a new, what, what's this number, she said. He said, you don't need premarital counseling. You need counseling. <laughs> what do you mean I need counseling? I told you, I mean, do you realize you're about to enter into a covenant relationship with somebody where the whole thing hinges upon being good for your word, and you're telling me he has a lying problem? She didn't get it. But you do, right? Now, let me ask you this. Uh, do you lie? Are there people in your life that, that you lie to every day because there's a booger hanging out of their nose? And everybody in your life knows that it's there, but them. And you've noted it to everybody else, but you've never noted it to them. The, the Proverbs address this. In Proverbs 26, uh, Proverbs have this really unflattering word for what you're doing, what I'm doing when I do that. A lying tongue hates those it hurts, and a flattering tongue works ruin. See, we think we're doing favors. What, what Proverbs is saying is we think we're doing our friends favors when we won't go there, and actually we're, we're going to be partially responsible for, for their destruction. In Ezekiel chapter 3, you could go there and read it on your own. There's this fascinating story where God says to this prophet, hey, here's these things you need to say to my people. And Ezekiel says, I, I don't want to say them. And God essentially says to him, if you say them, there's no blood on your hands. If you don't say them, there is. If you say them and there's no change, you're good. Your responsibility is to say it. Dave Ramsey has this brilliant quote, and this was actually literally one of the catalyst statements I heard that caused me to really start thinking about this myself, as he says this, to be unclear is to be unkind. See, that's what we do, right? Is we want to be the nice boss who's kind of unclear about the boundaries and then they break them and whack. And we thought we were being kind, but, but, but we're not. Paul says it this way. Go ahead to that next one, Jamie. He says, instead, speaking the truth in love. And look at the promise attached to these types of relationships. We will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. The promise is maturity. The means to get there isn't just you and your Bible or you and your prayer time or even you and narrate. It's you and the friends in your life who you can count on to tell you the hard things. So there's that, like, just, just identify people who, who you don't ever hear them saying things that they don't mean. And you can count on them and become that kind of person. I, I think of it this way, that if the only thing I do is don't say anything I don't mean, then the world, like, then I'm worlds ahead and my friends are worlds ahead. And the other part of that, and again, this is nothing new or ground uh, news breaking, but is uh, learn to be a kind, not an angry or reactive truth teller. Brad Lominick, a guy who used to lead this brilliant organization called Catalyst, uh, he has this statement. He says, the right thing, the right thing said the wrong way is still the wrong thing. So if you weren't overwhelmed yet, like hopefully you are now, because we've established like to be unclear is to be unkind, and yet the right thing said the wrong way, like that's still the wrong thing. Like this is tough stuff totally is. But we have to go there. It's Paul saying, like, speak the truth in love. I watched all this play itself out for me uh, when I went to psychotherapy about a month ago, which if your guess isn't a joke, like, I learned that I'm psychotic and you're psychotic and we're all psychotic. You should go. It's a really good experience, but I was in this, and I know I've revisited this, but so let me just kind of power through this in case you guys. I was in this process group with seven other people for a week. We spent between, I don't know, 25 hours together that week. We'd literally have a professional therapist in there, and it was crazy. Like, ironically, it was crazy, and we were crazy. And, uh, but there was this gal in there, um, and she was, she, she was brilliant. She had these really good observations, really well-intentioned, and she drove me crazy. Just saying, because I'm a sinner. So she, she just, and I, I, she, well, that's not fair. She didn't drive me crazy. She started to drive me crazy, and I couldn't figure out why, and I didn't know why until I made her cry. Um, because w what I figured out was uh, she's one of those people that has an idea and, and she could say it in, 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 and I, I, I do this too. She could say her idea in 30 seconds, but she says it 60 times over the next 30 minutes. So you just, this is the way I feel like, whoosh, whoosh, like here we go. Whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. We're just talking about the same idea and you talk fast and there's no pauses and you can't get in. And we're just like, and, and what do you start doing when someone does that? Right? Like, <sighs> I'm out, like, is, is anybody relating to this? Because I'm not getting much response from you. 
Is this because we all have this problem? When we, you're born with this problem, I'm convinced. You have to work on it. So what I didn't realize was uh, she was doing that, and the way I was responding was I would just start disagreeing just to, for the sake of disagreeing because I was so annoyed, and so I would interrupt her, and I'd interject an idea that was the opposite idea, and I might not even agree with the idea. I was just like, I couldn't listen anymore. So Thursday night, um, we're in our, last, our second to last time together, we didn't even have a therapist. It was all supposed to be like happy celebration. Like, here's the stuff I learned. Here's what I'm going to work on this week. And, and we go through the circle. And one of the guys, he shared some of his thoughts. And, and this gal, she interjected. Like, so I disagreed. So then we kind of got through that. I didn't even know this was happening, by the way. And then we got to her. And it was her turn. And I don't mean this to reflect poorly on her. But we got to her. And, and, and this, is, this is from my chair what's happening. And she goes... I can't talk. And she was crying. And we're all celebrating. I can't talk right now. Okay, so we can't talk. And, and, and in my head, I'm already feeling convicted. Like, I did it. I did it. Hope no one else sees I did it. I did it. A couple more people go. And one of the sensitive types in the group goes, hey, I think we should go back to her and hear from her. Okay. So we get back to her. And, and through sobs, she says, well, Adam made me cry. <laughs> so, like, I tried to click my heels three times, but I didn't get back to Helena. And so she just starts unloading, and it was all accurate. She started to say, like, every time I've talked for the last few days, you've disagreed with me. You don't disagree with anybody else, but you disagree with me all the time, and all this stuff that I'm going like, okay. And I received it, kind of. I mean, it took me a while. And, and I asked for her apology, and we, we kind of worked through that. And then I used this line that I was taught while I was there. It was worth the price of admission. I said to her, and I did not want to say it, but I said, uh, could, could, I, could I offer you some feedback? Because what they told us is if you ask, then they know that's what's happening and they don't get so mad. So husbands, try this with your wives. It's brilliant or vice versa. Can I offer you some feedback? And she said, yeah. And I took a deep breath and I said, okay, well, when you talk and like you do this thing and it it wasn't all that pretty and literally someone opened the door like hey you guys are half an hour late for dinner they're gonna take dinner away and we were like well see you later and we all got up and walked out the door like we didn't even get to resolve this thing so then i get to dinner and we're all supposed to like one big happy family eat dinner together she didn't come to dinner I'm like oh my gosh i'm so, i'm so such an idiot the next morning i got to breakfast and she was there with her boyfriend, and her boyfriend was huge. Like, <laughs> I'm not kidding. Like, bodybuilder huge. Like, gymnast, like, five foot five, and just huge. I sat behind him. I looked at his deltoids or whatever those things are in your back. I, I have a shoulder blade. He had, like, muscle. Um, so I'm literally getting my breakfast, like, looking over my shoulder. Of, when is this, you know, when does he grab me by the throat and shove me up against the wall? Didn't happen. It was delightful. We went to our last group. And it was our last group with, with the therapist, and she said, I, I'd like to go first. And she started crying again. And I'm like, oh, gosh, really? And she said, I went back to my room last night, and I told, I told my boyfriend what, what Adam had said. <laughs> what are you thinking if you're me right now, right? <laughs> she said, he looked at me and said, uh, I've been trying to tell you that for two years, but I wasn't sure how. And she went on to say, and, and, and she's sobbing through this. She said, I, I, I'm, I'm, I've been trying to figure out, like, why am I the type of person that, that no one ever calls? Why, why am I the type of person who, who loves people, but they don't ever ask for my advice? Well, what, what is wrong with my relationship with my brother? And, I mean, she, she, she went there, and what she was recognizing was this trait. It's why. Now, I'm not saying that to brag. I'm saying, like, that is a branded seal on my character going forward of the realization of this, this gal's in her 30s. It took a stranger, more or less, to point out to her the thing that she needed to hear the most. So let me ask you, what are the people in your life, what do they need to hear? And might it be true that you're not loving them by avoiding it, you're hurting them? And simultaneously, what, what, what type of space do you need to create? Maybe you need to empower some people, some people that you know mean what they say and that you can trust and that they'll say it kindly, but who do you need to empower to look at and go, listen, uh, here, here's a great question I heard a guy say this summer. Uh, what do you see from the other side of me? Just ask it. That Robert Kaplan says one of the best things that uh, managers and leaders can say to their employees is, what, what do I need to work on? Really difficult to ask. 
but might you need to open yourself up to a little more honest feedback? You know, the, the, the way this lands for me, I'm just spinning in circles because I don't know where my stool is. Where, where this lands for me, if I could just kind of bring us here, is my friend Fred said to me a couple weeks ago, he said, Adam, I, I, think, I think God waits for us every morning and noontime and evening. And he sits in his office and it, it is his sincere desire for us to pull up a chair and to look at him and to go, Lord, what, what do you want to talk to me about? What, 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 what do I need to work on? Now, I, I think the scriptures can play a huge role in that. But as much as we talk about, like, who are those people? And, and are you being that for other people in your life? I think we need to ask the question, like, are, are you allowing God to do that? Some of you are here and you're Christ followers. You would readily call yourself a Christian, though you'd be reluctant maybe because you'd want to define exactly what we mean by that and all that thing. Let me ask you this. Are, are, you, are you empowering God in your life to, to point the stuff out that, that, that's, that's going to be the tipping point for you as a leader, as, 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 a, as a boss, as a spouse, as a, as a parent? Are you eliminating hurry from your life to the extent that he has room to talk? And for those of you that you don't follow Jesus, I, I think this is a really great opportunity to explore what that would look like. Uh, because sometimes we make it about these very big, very important kind of theological points. Maybe we could just suspend that for a while. Just, just put it over there for a little bit. And instead, maybe, maybe here would be an effective challenge for you. You go before God. And you go like, well, I don't even know if he exists. Great, just go before your wall. And you sit there. And you say, Lord, is there anything you want to say? I don't even know if you're real. Is there anything that you would want to point out? See, what the scriptures tell us is, is that the word of God is so darn accurate. More accurate than the, than the best of surgeons. So, so you begin to gauge uh, God's effectiveness, whether or not he's real, just based upon his ability to to speak some truth to you that changes your marriage, that changes the way you think about yourself, that changes the way you function as, as an employee or a leader. Just, just try him. Because what we know from the scriptures is, is God is not a God who is satisfied just patting us on the butt all the time and telling us we're perfect and he'll see us in heaven. Like the scripture uses these really heavy words and they're oftentimes really abusive words, words like repentance, and confession, words like forgiveness. And sometimes we talk about them like a sledgehammer, like God wants to beat things out of us. But the image that the scriptures create for what it takes to be well is, is to be the kinds of people that recognize that if we're going to win the gold medal, we're going to need somebody to help us, to help us recognize what's, what's wrong with us. So we can, and around here, we, we eliminate a lot of what feels like in our time and our place unnecessary trappings of what it means to be the church. But we ought not eliminate the role of repentance and confession and submission and coming before a holy, perfect God who knows you so well that he, he knows every hair on your head, Jesus says, and giving him space to go, can we, can we talk about this? we talk about this? If you would like to engage further with Narrate Church, you can find contact information online, www.narratechurch.org. We would love to hear from you.